I would like now to introduce today's presenters. Akshat Baid, Vice President, leads Engineering Services Research and Advisory at, Ever at Everest Group. He assists global enterprises on a variety of initiatives across engineering, technology, outsourcing, and ecosystem engagement. Mayank Maria, Practice Director, is a member of the engineering services team and assists clients on topics related to engineering spending and outsourcing across key verticals, including automotive, high-tech, industrial, and medical services. Nishant Udapa is a practice director on the engineering services team and advises clients on topics related to engineering and R&D, ERD, spending, technology adoption, and global sourcing across engineering verticals. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Aksha. Thanks, Rafael. Um, and thanks everyone for gathering. I see a lot of people uh, joined in from different geographies and time zones. Glad all of you could make it. Uh, we've all gathered here today to discuss the digital product engineering theme. I must say it's one of the most talked about themes in the context of global engineering and research and development. And happy to do this webinar uh, today to share some of our observations and learnings about this space. So our discussion today will largely be split into three sections. So the first one, it, you know, we're going to spend some time talking about the world of digital product engineering. Um, and we'll first of all try and build some consensus into what is digital product engineering. We all know digital has been a severely overused term. Uh, it's been applied in a variety of different contexts. So we'll, we'll try and build a consensus to what is it, you know, a common understanding of uh, what space are we talking about. We'll also spend some time around understanding how the enterprise world has taken to this phenomenon, what's really driving the adoption and some other aspects as well. Uh, in the second part of our discussion today, we'll talk about what does it mean to undertake uh, a journey towards digital product engineering, uh, or how you know what does it mean to undertake such a program. Uh, so, if you're an enterprise somewhere in the journey, uh, what should you anticipate? What should you plan for? Uh, we'll try and cover some of that. We'll also spend some time talking about um, the outsourced digital product engineering services, a space that we recently analyzed. Uh, in the vendor landscape assessments that we conducted recently. Lastly, uh, time permitting, we would like to invest some of it into Q&A. Uh, we've already received some questions upfront uh, and you know, very likely we'll get some more as well through the discussion. Please keep uh, seeding and sending those to us through the Q&A box, uh, like was explained earlier. All right, so without any further delay, let's get into it. So the first things first, what is digital product engineering, right? So, you know, look, if, if actually to understand digital product engineering, we should take a step back. What is digital engineering? Uh, as you can read on the screen, digital engineering helps elevate experience and efficiency across product consumption, manufacturing, and engineering, right? So if you look at the life cycle of a product, right, it runs across three key stages. It is engineered, it is manufactured, and finally it is consumed at the end of the consumer, right? There are aspects of digital engineering that can be associated with each one of these three stages. So let me start with engineering. So on the engineering front, we're talking about the use of digital technology to simulate, to reduce the time and expense uh, that goes into the design and engineering of products. Uh, we, we are trying to make engineering more predictable and data rich. Uh, the next stage, like I said earlier, is of manufacturing, right? Here we are talking about making the process of manufacturing itself uh, much more you know, predictable, smarter, connected, and autonomous. There all, there's also an equipment angle to this. There's also a people angle to this on the shop floor. Right? The third bit, uh, which you know, we've highlighted on the next page, um, is where uh, you know, we are going to focus most of our discussion today, which is product consumption. Essentially, meaning you know, what does the product offer to the consumer? What are the feature and functionality that are added onto the on the onto the product itself, right? So uh, lots of things to observe here. Uh, one, I'd say this is happening across industries. We are talking about products which are 
smarter, which are intelligent uh, in different industries, in different product segments, you would see products really becoming more and more, you know, connected, smart, and intelligent, right? Uh, if, you, if, and, and you, you, if you actually observe this at your end, if you pick any industry, if you pick uh, any use case, right, whether it's in the medical devices space, whether it is in the automotive world, you would see that the nature of the products has really changed from what it used to be, say, half a decade ago to what they are today. And we'll speak more about it in, in you know, some time as well. Uh, what this directly means is products are also now a part of a connected ecosystem. They're not standalone offerings anymore. They are typically connected, very well knit into a, a larger fabric of uh, things, devices, networks, and so on. Uh, the other thing to note here is that the experiences which these products offer, they are very personalized. Personalized to individual needs, personalized to tastes, personalized to even the context that these products uh, would be in at different points in time. And lastly, uh, making you know, product consumption more digital also means that we are talking about newer forms of consumption. Um, a good example of this is to move against, uh, move away from a one-time consumption of a product to more of a as-a-service consumption, right? Which is a which is a very big deal for enterprises. We're going to talk about that as well in a little bit, right? So essentially, that's the focus of our discussion today: products which are smarter which are connected, which are intelligent, which bring in an angle of autonomy into the consumption and so on. And underlying all of this, there are digital themes and technologies. We don't intend to go into any one of those in, in detail today because of the dearth of time. But I think it, it should suffice to say that most of the digital product engineering initiatives and by extension, the products that we are talking about, they leverage these digital themes uh, at you know, some permutation or combination of these themes is definitely leveraged uh, in, in engineering of these products. Right, so let's take a step forward. Let's understand what is the value chain of digital product engineering, right? I'm gonna invite Mayank now to cover this and the next couple of pages. Mayank? Yeah, thanks a lot, Akshan. So uh, see on this page, uh, what we are depicting is the value chain that any digital product would go through uh, to uh, eventually reach its end users or customers, right? At the face of it, uh, the value chain is very similar to, you know, even if we were talking about traditional products. So there are activities like, you know, ideation and design where you actually blueprint, uh, you decide what your product is going to be about, uh, what are your technology choices around the product, right? What are the features that the product needs to offer, so on and so forth. Product development is all about core engineering, say software engineering, hardware engineering, integration of software and hardware, integration of different modules, so on and so forth. Testing and certification, essentially about validating, verifying that the features that you designed the product for, right? It's serving that intended purpose. And it's also complying with regulations of different geographies, different industries, et cetera. And eventually, you know, once the product is out in the market, providing those uh, regular updates, upgrades, providing customer support, even providing some services, uh, you know, downstream services around the product, right? So, you know, to think of it, to hear it, it's all very similar, but the rigor with which, you know, we need to go through all of this process when it comes to digital products, right? It's very different. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about it uh, in a while. Uh, that's the point I want to drive there. Another point uh, on the previous slide itself, right? Digital products also, you know, they can be of different types. And I'm not referring to uh, products by industries or, uh, you know, that kind of a thing here. It's essentially, you know, what's being digitized here. So I think the first bucket, uh, it's around the more traditional products, say, you know, you imagine an aeroplane, an automobile, right? and some components of it being digitized. So say an infotainment and in-flight entertainment, a virtual cockpit, right? So the product is still more or less a traditional product, but there are some very rich digital components uh, being infused into the product, right? Uh, the second bucket, I think uh, what we can call as digital bond physical products, right? So imagine products like smart watches, smart speakers, right? essentially products which rely very heavily on digital technologies like AI, ML, data, connectivity, right? And without these themes, 
they probably don't mean much, right? They are not able to deliver much value to the end users, right? And then there is a third bucket as well here, right? Uh, which is around platforms. So you would have probably used a lot of these connected digital products that uh, you know are not much if there is not a, a, an app or a platform accompanying the product, which essentially gathers a lot of data from the product. And you know, then there are services offered based on that platform. So all of these, they include, uh, you know, these are included within digital product engineering, as we call it. Now, moving ahead, uh, why don't we build a quick view on how digital products have really evolved in terms of what kind of value they are delivering to the end users, right? And maybe I can do it with an example. Uh, say, let's talk about a medical device, let's say a hearing aid, right? Think about a hearing aid from about 10 years back, right? It was a fairly rigid physical device with a battery and, you know, some kind of, a, you know, a equipment to amplify the sound for a person, right? But that was about it. And once the device had been handed over, there was no connectivity, there was no tracking, there was no personalization, so to say, right? Versus fast, fast forward to today, right? A hearing device, you know, right from uh, when it's sold, the processor for the device, it's customized for the user, right? And the requirement. Uh, the device is connected uh, to the cloud. It's connected to a mobile app even, right? The data that's gathered, right? That uh, is supplied to the user of the device, to the caregiver, even to the manufacturing company. And in that sense, the user has some control on personalizing the experience the caregiver can uh, actually keep a tab on how the device is doing and what kind of experience it's delivering to the user. And in the end, even the manufacturing company knows how the device is being used and has some feedback on how the product can be evolved, right? So essentially a sea change here, if I may call it, in terms of what the devices can do, what the devices can offer, and hence what kind of experience the end users can enjoy with them, right? And if you move forward, uh, you know, even within the digital products, right, there's a bit of a continuum going uh, in terms of what they can achieve, right? So starting from the left, and I think these were more the traditional use cases uh, that the companies achieved. And I think most of the products today, right, they are able to conduct some kind of monitoring and control, but, uh, you know, these are more rule-based monitoring, rule-based control, right? Not a lot of intelligence. But as we move to the right, you know, uh, in addition to data and analytics, when you know AI and ML come in, there is a lot of optimization that devices are able to do uh, themselves even, right? So think about smart speakers, right? As a user uses them, the speakers, they actually learn, right? About what the preferences have been for the user. And eventually, you know, they start throwing very relevant results uh, via search, via voice interfaces, et cetera. And lastly, autonomy, right? Uh, Devices starting to act on their own very intelligently, right? Uh, you don't, you're not even having to ask for certain actions and the devices based on patterns being able to do that, right? So this is a bit of a continuum here. Uh, you know, the products typically evolve across this continuum, but you know, uh, one thing that we should also notice that not every product needs to evolve through this continuum because you know, there essentially is some investment involved in each of these stages. So it has to be a bit of a trade-off between what kind of value can be garnered through this evolution versus what the investment uh, has to be put in, right? So, uh, you know, why don't we move further ahead here? Uh, and before we do that, right, before we get to some specifics on the market and the adoption, why don't we check with the audience, right? Uh, what your uh, adoption rates have been around digital product engineering. How important do you consider it uh, based on the business or the role that you are in? And maybe, you know, uh, take around 30 seconds to address uh, this and then we can discuss the results. By the way, I think I am seeing two competing options here, the top two ones uh, very much as we expected it to be. But let's conclude it and dis then discuss the results even further. I think the, there's a clear winner that's emerging here, right? Uh, digital product engineering having a significant impact on the business in terms of operations, in terms of efficiency, in terms of, you know, what business you are in maybe, right? Uh, 
we, we are seeing lesser number of people actually going with the first option, which is around, you know, we are not in business currently. And I think that's also something uh, that resonates with how we are seeing the market evolve, right? A lot of companies, uh, they are still in the stage of uh, exploring, experimenting how digital product engineering can benefit them, right? And before scaling up, uh, they tend to contemplate whether to take this journey or not, right? But more on, uh, more on it uh, by my colleague, Nishant. Nishant, why don't you take it ahead on the and, industry? And, side? and before he comes in, I think I must emphasize on this last bit, which I see. Uh, the last option, which was we haven't assessed, uh, aren't aware of the business case, uh, zero responses. It's, it's quite um, you know revealing in terms of the state of affairs with digital product engineering. Anyway, sorry, Nishan, back to you. Absolutely, I think we can move forward. And thanks, Mayank. Uh, indeed, an interesting set of results. And largely, I think in line with how we see the market as well. Right. So Akshat and Mayank both provided a fairly comprehensive overview into what digital products are. Let me now provide some numbers and go deeper into the market in general. And essentially, a couple of things to note on this slide. Of course, I won't be you know, going deep into each number, but what's really interesting to note is how quickly the market has already grown, right? So already digital products account for around 15, 16% of the overall ERD spending. And this is despite the fact that you know digital products have really emerged only over the last few years. So this is by no means a nascent market, as you can see from the number on the right of your screen, right? So digital products already account for over $200 billion of spending in the engineering and R&D world. The second very interesting thing to note here is how quickly the market is growing. So spending on digital products is growing at well over 17%, in fact, somewhere between 17 to 18%, uh, whereas spending on traditional products is growing only at about 4%. And we expect this, you know, these growth rates to sustain over the next few years. So maybe four or five years down the line, uh, the share of digital product in overall ERD will grow from 15, 16 to well beyond 25% as well. And well, spending is you know, not just on digital products, but enterprises are also spending on things like talent, ensuring that they have the right digital technologies that they are investing in, ensuring that their organization is shaped up to cater to digital products, uh, ensuring that they're engaging with the right partners and so on and so forth. Uh, now, we've covered why or rather how much enterprises are investing into digital products. Let me now talk about why enterprises are spending on so uh, are spending so much on digital products. And uh, essentially, on the next slide, what we have is six factors or what we look at the six key growth drivers uh, behind digital products. And uh, let me touch upon each of this, each of these in a bit more detail, right? So the first one, which is around increased demand for connected products and experiences, and Akshat alluded to this uh, in his first slide itself, right? So customer preferences are changing. So the consumer of today, especially the end consumer, wants a lot more personalization. Uh, they want personalized recommendations. They want customized products. Uh, they want insights that are personalized uh, for them right on their smartphone. And they want a seamless experience across channels. Right, So I could be listening to a piece of audio on my smart speaker at home. And when I stop that piece of audio and start driving to work, I want that piece of audio to continue on the infotainment system in my car. So providing that seamless experience across channels, providing that continuity is where a lot of, is where a lot of enterprise investment is going today. The second piece uh, around technological advances is perhaps the most relevant. Essentially, a lot of use cases around digital products are today becoming relevant just because technology has advanced, right? So if we talk about connectivity, for instance, we all know that 5G is going to become the network of choice over the next few years. And you know, essentially 5G will enable intelligence at the edge. It will enable various use cases around autonomy, right? Similarly, there, are, there have been advances in chipsets, in technologies like IoT, in artificial intelligence, image sensing, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, we're also aware of how technologies like augmented and virtual reality are evolving. And essentially, that's why it's so much noise around the metaverse today. The third factor then is around competition. And essentially, a fairly simple one. If your peers in the market are investing in digital products, uh, you would have to do the same. Essentially, just to retain your customers and sustain in the market, you will have to invest more, uh, more and more in offering uh, you know, improved customer satisfaction and improved or other better experiences to your customers. Uh, the fourth one is again a new one, and this is one change that we've observed over the past few years where essentially enterprises are evolving newer revenue streams 
there is the serviceization of products. Uh, so essentially what's happening is enterprises are shifting from a pure product-based mindset to also offering services now in an as-a-service mode, right? And this is particularly relevant in the B2B segment where enterprises are essentially looking to obtain some kind of continuity in their revenue flow rather than just looking at customers who will buy their products, let's say once in five years, right? So let's take an, an example of an industrial products company that's manufacturing, let's say a compressor or a pump, right? So instead of uh, you know, selling these products to a factory uh, you know, once every few years, what enterprises are now doing is essentially uh, retaining the ownership of the equipment and charging their customers only on the basis of how much air gets compressed or how much, or what's the quantity of product that they use, right? Uh, and of course, they can easily keep a track of this thanks to the whole, you know, whole lot of sensors that they have attached to the product, which keeps sending across data in real time. Uh, what this also allows the enterprise to do is uh, because of because of the fact that they are getting data in real time, they can offer services around, you know, predictive maintenance. They can predict when a fault might occur and offer repair operations and so on and so forth. The fifth factor, in fact, is related to this, and this is around uh, generating insights for engineering teams. Essentially, now that enterprises have so much data coming to them in real time, they also have information around how customers are using their data, right? So which are the features that are getting used the most by customers? Which are the features that are maybe not so popular and can be discarded? Uh, where is the problem occurring in the, in the product usage? Essentially completing that feedback loop. I think that's where enterprises are finding a lot of value when it comes to connected ecosystems or connected products. Uh, and finally, of course, we all know about the whole multitude of use cases that was brought in as a result of the COVID pandemic. Uh, essentially, the shift towards zero touch or virtual products, self-help products, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, sustainability. Uh, sustainability, of course, is a big area, but a lot of sustainability today is around monitoring energy consumption, monitoring water consumption, waste monitoring, and so on. And a lot of this, of course, happens through sensors, uh, essentially brought about by uh, you know, connectivity and platforms themselves. Now, on the next slide, let me talk about how the market is segmented. Uh, and as some of these numbers indicate, digital products are relevant across geographies and across verticals, right? So the automotive industry, of course, leads spending. And a lot of this is driven by investments into autonomous vehicles as well as connected vehicles. So themes like infotainment systems, telematics, uh, V2X connectivity or vehicle to vehicle connectivity are you know, some of the major themes or use cases that enterprises are investing in. And it's not just the startups or the new age companies, the likes of Tesla who are doing this. Uh, I think we've seen lots of announcements over the past couple of years where even the larger OEMs, the traditional automakers are also now pivoting towards a software defined vehicle. The other big industry I would say is the consumer electronics industry. And I think we are all aware of the wearables market, the smart home systems market, and I think these have become ubiquitous now. But I think where the industry is also heading towards is autonomy, right? So let's take the example of a smart security system, right? There's already elements of intelligence uh, which have been built into these products. But now I think there are features of autonomy also coming in. So can a smart security system get activated as soon as, let's say, the owner of a house leaves the premises? Right? So a lot of these autonomous features are now getting inbuilt and embedded into products. Uh, when it comes to telecom, I think it's all about virtualization of networks, you know, use cases around SDN and NFV, uh, developing smart routers, gateways, and so on. Uh, and I think 5G is the generation which is a lot more software-centric as compared to previous generations. And I think that's what some of these numbers indicate. Uh, let me maybe take one more industry, and that's the medical devices world. Uh, and I think this one here, it's all about software as a medical device, the evolution of medical wearables, implants, biosensors, and a whole host of devices essentially that can uh, that are enabling remote patient monitoring, telehealth, and a lot of other use cases that have come about as a result of the pandemic. Uh, now, when it comes to geography, I think largely this the segmentation is lined with how we see engineering and R&D spending itself. So North America and Western Europe would lead would lead the market followed by APAC, and of course, there are countries like China, Japan, South Korea, within Asia Pacific that would lead this industry. Uh, and then you have the rest of the world, so the likes of Latin America, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and so on. Uh, so the message here is that you know spending and use cases are quite varied in nature, but essentially there is little doubt that digital products are, a few, are the future of this industry. And I think this sort of reflects in a lot of our conversations with enterprises as well. 
Uh, and in fact, we carried out a survey of enterprises across industries, across geographies, and across enterprises of various sizes. And in fact, you would see the results of that survey on the next slide, where I think the, I think the numbers would speak for themselves, right? So uh, I maybe take a pause here so that you could consume the results, but only around 9% of enterprises uh, indicated that they have not invested in any digital product engineering initiative, right? So either they don't find it relevant, or they are still evaluating the use case, but essentially less than 10% who are not interested in the digital product engineering world. And what this essentially means is that more than 90% of enterprises have in some shape or form already invested into digital products, right? So around 29% of them are in the POC stage or doing pilot projects, essentially figuring out what the returns are, which digital features to implement before they start scaling some of their initiatives. Uh, a lot of enterprises today would be in the green zone. So what you see in uh, what the 37% is essentially the traditional OEMs, the larger enterprises who implemented digital technologies in some products uh, and they've started to get results as well. And uh, what they're now waiting to do is essentially scale that to the rest of their portfolio as well. The first category, the 25% are the enterprises that have scaled initiatives across multiple products or all products in their portfolio. And a lot of the digital natives or startups essentially come into this category, right? Uh, these firms usually have a smaller portfolio and by design, they would have integrated and embedded digital technologies across their portfolio. And of course, this is where a lot of the larger OEMs also now want to be. Right, so that then brings me to an end to the section on market overview. Let me now hand it back to Akshat who will speak more on some of the things that uh, should be kept in mind by enterprises as they embark on their digital product engineering journey. Yeah, and, and as I do that, actually, we could go to the previous page first. Um, as I do that, I think I want to contrast a couple of points that were raised. I think a while ago, we conducted a poll wherein we asked you uh, essentially around your interest. What do you feel about digital engineering? And I think the overwhelming response was that uh, we can't do without it or we find it indispensable to um, operational efficiency and experience, I think it was. Right? But on just on the previous page, we also saw another way to look at the data that you just saw, right? That really just 25% of the companies have already been able to scale it across multiple products. So as we can see, I think, you know, between intent and actual maturity, there is a journey, right? It's a spread of enterprises in terms of their maturity. And we see only a fourth of enterprises who are who really achieved scale. Uh, we must acknowledge here that, uh, you know, the, the journey of digital product engineering it's it's not a simple process and achieving such majority uh, maturity uh, you know it's a it's a journey where even some of the people who are at the advanced stages they have had a certain you know path to the success they currently have we have our point of view on what that journey looks like but before we do that let's just do one more quick poll right um, this is open now um, you know let's hear from the audience i think it's a fairly simple question uh, what has your organization's digital product engineering adoption journey been like? You know, what do you think about it? Has it been a cakewalk? Uh, have you attained scale but achieved success only in silos? Uh, have you done POCs which are successful but scaling is proving really harder? Um, have you started to experiment but unable to achieve scale for the desired outcomes? And lastly, you know, are you at a stage where you're still struggling to figure out what avenues to invest in? Yep, I've already started to see some results come up. Um, let's just give it maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, I think, you know, uh, we can perhaps end the poll now. Uh, I think I only see one response, uh, some lucky person in this room who says, it's been a cakewalk. Uh, I congratulate them and I must uh, humbly ask them to share their experiences with others as well. But the overwhelming majority is where people have done POCs which are successful, but scaling is really proving harder. Nearly 50% of them are there. And another 30 odd percent say that they've attained scale uh, but the, you know, success is only achievable in silos, right? Again, you know, this is not uh, something that uh, comes as a surprise. We've seen multiple enterprises being 
um, you know, in, 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 in similar positions. I mean, in our role as advisors to the digital product engineering ecosystem, we get to engage and help a lot of enterprises who've taken up this journey um, and assimilating, you know, what we've learned from them. Uh, there are lots of roadblocks. You know, if you go to the next page, we'll see we've captured some of those roadblocks clearly, right? Uh, many of them, uh, and, you know, we, we perhaps don't have a lot of time to cover all of them, but let me just try and give you a glimpse of them. So the first two that I talked about, they are talented technology. See, it's a uh, digital product engineering is, is not doable if you don't have the required technology know-how and the competence in teams, which is required to execute on those technologies. Keep in mind that the world of engineering is right now going through a severe crunch of, uh, you know, digitally skilled workforce. Uh, and by the way, there's a high diversity in technology, in domains, et cetera. So orchestrating that and also dealing with challenges around which technologies to pick up, how to manage interoperability, what are some of those considerations? It's a fairly, fairly huge, one of the most important challenges I'd say. The second one uh, is around the uh, you know ecosystem of vendors, right? Digital product engineering program and the you know kind of uh, undergoing that particular process. Um, I think it's you know safe to say that it's not uh, a one man's job. You really have to organize uh, and orchestrate a program wherein you connect with a lot of vendors. So doing that, identifying the right ones, engaging with them, maintaining relationships with them and working in a manner that all of your engineering programs work in a fashion that the vendors come together for you, it's a huge, huge task. The, the next couple, regulatory compliance and cybersecurity, I think both are uh, kind of evolutionary in nature. On the regulatory bit, I'd say that the nature of the product itself is evolving. More and more products are becoming digital, uh, which means that newer functionality is being added, newer types of possibilities are being created and the regulatory frameworks are really catching up. So all the testing certification needs are there, they are evolving in sync. And the enterprises who are in the process of building those products, they, uh, with every passing day, are, are dealing with newer regulations to comply with. Similarly, on the cybersecurity side, um, as products are becoming more smart, more connected, intelligent, and autonomous, uh, by nature, they are interfacing with a lot more personal and sensitive data, right? What that means is a lot of these engineering spenders, they're having a hard time to even understand and manage this newer paradigm of, of engineering. I mean, a lot of these, these uh, industries that Nishan spoke about a while ago, they had nothing to do with, you know, some of these themes in the past. And there are other factors as well, you know, environmental factors, social factors, um, managing the changes within the organizations. This is this is a fairly significant change. You know, we are asking engineering teams to move into a variety of different forms of engineering, which they have, you know, as well not really been, you know, dealing with. So it's a it's a very very big, huge pack of roadblocks and challenges that they really need to, uh, you know, address. So uh, to summarize, I think the digital product. Yeah, I think one point before you move ahead. Uh, you know, I feel very strongly about it uh, with this ESG or sustainability, right? Maybe today it's in the gray. I foresee it coming to an orange or a green fairly soon. And I think one thing that comes to mind is the whole energy footprint of some of these digital product engineering initiatives. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, you know, think about AI, ML, think about blockchain, now metaverse, right? The kind of processing part that's needed here, right? Uh, I think the carbon footprint uh, numbers, targets for companies, they are going to go for a toss. So how do they kind of navigate that? I think that's going to be a big challenge. No, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. I think uh, showcases how something as simple as, um, you know, adopting a newer upcoming technology in your products can have a very significant impact on something completely disconnected, right? No, great point. So to, to summarize, I think, you know, there are some very real sets of challenges. Digital product engineering has not been easy so far. And is it, it, it's not even likely to get easy in the future. So what you see on your screen here is our belief in terms of what enterprises need to do. We are advising a three-pronged approach to achieving success in digital product engineering. Um, and quite in sync with, you know, what I spoke about earlier. The first one is around talented technology. Uh, I spoke about the dirt. I spoke about how important it is to have access to that, that talent. So, you know, we are talking about how uh, it's going to be key to create a significant and sustained access to that talent. Second bit is around engineering processes. So um, 
you know, engineering of the digital products really commands a very radical shift to the engineering processes. Uh, I mean, given the nature of the technology, the collaboration requirements, the evolution consideration, I think all of those mean that there's an underlying process. The underlying processes rather, you know, they need to evolve in sync with these changes. And lastly, I spoke about the ecosystem. Organizations really need to become effective orchestrators of the ecosystem entity, right? We're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit of detail. Uh, let's start with the talent and technology bit. Mayank, why did you come in now? So I think Akshat, you already alluded to, you know, what kind of talent shortage we are facing across some of these technologies, right? Uh, we, by the way, for the audience, uh, we have a lot of data around these specific technology pieces, streams, right? What's the kind of demand that uh, these spaces are facing and what's the uh, supply, right? Uh, I think what we can conclude on is that the supply far lags the demand, right? Uh, and you know we anticipate that to continue in the near future as well, right? Uh, given that the supply enablers, be it academia, be it businesses themselves, right? They're not moving at as fast as their own demand for talent is changing, right? What essentially that has meant is, and what it has resulted into is uh, a pricing premium, a price premium that has to be paid around these skill sets, right? Again, no surprise, and everybody on the call uh, would agree to it, right? I think what we are uh, you know, alluding to is that paying these price premiums, right, it doesn't really hurt. Maybe in the short term, right, it pinches. But, uh, you know, with that, being willing to pay that price premium uh, so that you can attract the right talent at scale and more importantly, also retain that talent for a long term, right, that will pay in the long term, right, in terms of your scaled initiatives, continuity, evolution of products and, you know, uh, meaning good things for business. So essentially not looking at the uh, price premiums that are visible today, but at the long-term picture of how that will benefit your own products and business. Right? That's what an enterprise or business should be focusing on. Uh, moving ahead, you know, uh, given the situation uh, with talent right now, right, there is a lot that any enterprise, even a service provider has to do uh, in maintaining, attaining the right kind of talent, the right kind of scale. And we are really pro uh, provoking you to do uh, things on two sides. One is things that you can start doing internally, right? Uh, making the best of what assets you already have internally, right? And that's by the way is your existing talent, right? So, you know, uh, again, not a surprise that some skills are becoming redundant, right? Going down in terms of demand, while others that we saw on the previous page, they are picking up, right? So it makes a lot of sense to see what are the avenues to really upscale, uh, upskill, reskill your own talent, right? That could effectively be, uh, you know, uh, more efficient in scaling up your digital product engineering talent, right? Then uh, talent retention, uh, you know, in this war for talent today, right? Talent retention is going to be fairly important. So do what you can, uh, you know, in terms of incentives, in terms of keeping your employees engaged, uh, challenge them with new problem statements, right? Make them feel excited about their work. Right? That's going to be very important. And lastly, using a lot of uh, data that you have uh, available in your systems, right, to your own benefit. So analytics around talent data, right? What's uh, making your employees happy, what's maybe causing some resentment and, you know, proactively addressing those kind of aspects, even forecasting your own talent needs in advance and making those investments in advance so that you are prepared, right? Those are some of the aspects to take care of uh, internally. And then, you know, uh, we believe that just this will not suffice. You will also still have to go uh, outside to your partners, to the ecosystem. So, leveraging your own centers, scaling them up in near shore, offshore locations, leveraging partnership ecosystem across these locations to scale up. Academia, you know, they've traditionally been important, but leveraging them in a more meaningful way, right? Uh, partnering them with them early on so that, you know, the talent that's coming out from them, you can contribute uh, into making them industry ready, uh, deployment ready, and then actually benefit from it. And lastly, I think on looking outside, it's more unconventional, Not ha has not been done a lot. That's around some of the newer models of procuring talent, right? So gig economy, contingent workforce, uh, you know, there's a lot that we are hearing on companies building platforms to do this, 
but still in their nascent stages in terms of how well uh, it's being used. So I think one suggestion, you know, start exploring it at least for some of the non-crucial projects, right? Non-time sensitive projects, maybe see how that works out and then scale it up. But that's something that will be required. Again. Moving ahead, I think, uh, you know, building a very robust location strategy will also be important. So what you're seeing currently on the page are, you know, some of the digital product engineering hubs, right? There's a variety of them. There are locations onshore, near shore, offshore, right? Have their own propositions to offer, have their very different talent profiles, right? Their own benefits, even some challenges to go with that, right? So, you know, figuring out the right mix uh, of these locations as per your own requirements, as per your own trade-offs even, right? That's very important. And you know, this also needs to be fairly dynamic. So it's not a one-done activity. It has to be done over and over as your talent needs evolve, as your products evolve. So, you know, uh, staying on top of this uh, is going to be fairly important. Okay. So I think those are some of the points we wanted to highlight on the talent side. Uh, the process side, the ecosystem side are also things that we plan to discuss. And why don't I uh, invite Nishant back into the conversation to take it forward. Right. Thank you, Mayank. And completely agree with the points you made there. So talent is indeed very critical for an enterprise looking to adopt digital products. But what can really differentiate enterprises are, I think, the engineering processes themselves, right? And here I'm going to touch upon three different things. Number one is the evolution cycle itself, right? So how quickly are you able to roll out upgrades and updates to your products? Right. So, of course, we are all aware of how Tesla changed the game essentially by rolling out software upgrades in an over the air or OTA manner of every few weeks. And now we are actually seeing all the traditional, the legacy OEMs also following suit. Right. So, this transition from being a pure hardware product vendor, where your product life cycle could be, let's say, two to three years, to a more software driven organization which rolls out upgrades, let's say, every few weeks, I think that transition is a very critical one to make. The second factor I think is a more obvious change and this is about digitizing your engineering and R&D processes. So how heavily do you leverage digital technologies in your engineering process, right? Are you using platforms? Are you using things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, analytics in your processes? Are you leveraging augmented and virtual reality in let's say your product design process, right? Uh, are you making use of digital twins and simulation to test for and validate a number of scenarios before then finally zeroing down on the one that best suits your customer needs. Uh, are you maintaining a digital thread of all your products and processes so that let's say if things go wrong, you're able to revert back to uh, an earlier stage, right? So I think how heavily you are able to leverage digital technologies also adds speed, it adds efficiencies to your engineering processes, and that eventually creates differentiation down the line. The third factor then is all about enabling collaboration between engineering teams and eliminating silos internally. So interaction between the business teams and engineering teams is critical in terms of communicating what customers are looking for, in terms of communicating where the demand lies, right? Uh, the second important thing is probably collaboration between the hardware and software teams. So given the fact that software life cycles are probably 10 times as fast as hardware life cycles, right? So are you ensuring that the hardware is compatible with all the future software upgrades that are going to be rolled out over the next few months and years, right? And then, of course, you know, given the fact that the evolution cycles are themselves shorter, you need persistent teams as well, essentially to maintain some sort of continuity in your engineering process because the product might look significantly different two years down the line than what, than what it is today, right? So I think persistent and continuity in teams is also an important factor. Now, digital product engineering, of course, is especially complex and no enterprise can do it alone, which is why the role of the ecosystem is so much more important today. So until a few years back, I think enterprises would largely engage with just suppliers. So if we take the example of, let's say, an automaker, an automaker would only be engaged with its suppliers who would provide them with certain components or certain parts or even certain finished products that would just have to be assembled into the product. Right. At max, they would be uh, engaging with a few technology vendors or software providers who would be providing, let's say, software tools for their internal processes and systems. Today, of course, all of that has changed, right? With the advent of the software defined vehicle and the connected vehicle, an automaker must engage with, let's say, a cloud vendor or a hyperscaler 
they have to engage with a platform provider they need to talk to the connectivity providers they need to talk to chipset vendors uh, let's say a lot of the technology vendors or isv companies they need to talk to people who are providing tools who are providing infrastructure various kinds of certification agencies people who can provide cyber security and so on so the importance of who you engage with or the ecosystem itself has really gone up multiple notches over the past few years and especially of course with the advent of digital products now it's not just part it's not just in the product engineering process that you know these partners come in handy there are multiple benefits associated with having a robust ecosystem uh, so the hyperscalers especially provide you with access to multiple tools and technologies that get used uh, across your product engineering process they provide your talent uh, with upskilling initiatives that helps you build competencies in digital technologies uh, and of course there are multiple instances where partners uh, where there are uh, where enterprises partner with other entities and jointly go to market and take their products to um, essentially to various geographies marketplace reach i think is also very important where uh, certain partners could come in and open up new markets for an enterprise uh, these could be in terms of having or providing access to wider customer base or newer geographies itself right uh, if you move on to the next slide now i think i'll just very quickly cover some ecosystem entities that enterprises are already partnering with and uh, essentially cloud vendors as i said the hyperscalers are the ones who provide the infrastructure on which a lot of the platforms are based hardware vendors include your chipset providers uh, makers of sensors uh, the providers of displays circuits etc and all of these of course have a very important role to play in connected products uh, consortia i think are very important uh, these enable the use of best practices and standards and i think enterprises who are a part of some of these consortia uh, also have a role to play in all the standards that are getting adopted across industries and that then automatically gives them a head start as some of these newer technologies come to the fore uh, isps and technology vendors of course provide all kinds of software for development for testing for system integration and so on uh, and finally of course there are universities who provide uh, cutting edge research on emerging use cases who provide access to talent uh, and in a lot of cases uh, universities of course also provide uh, access to infrastructure that they could be hosting in their uh, you know on their premises uh, the one interesting thing to note here i think is how there is a convergence across industries so irrespective of which industry the enterprise is from right so you could be an automaker you could be from the medical devices industry you could be a smart home system manufacturer every enterprise making a smart connected and autonomous product would have to engage with a common set or a common category of partners although of course the individual within each of these categories might differ depending on the domain but the categories would largely remain the same and i think without engaging with these ecosystem entities engineering of digital products would really be almost impossible now the one category of ecosystem entity that i did not mention are the third party service providers and let me now call on mayank to elaborate on the same thanks uh, nishant i think a uh, very important entity in this whole puzzle right the outsourcing service providers here given how the talent equation is playing out right uh, the outsourcing players have a very big role to play and also because this is such a new, nascent new place for so many enterprises they are really looking for a partner who can uh be with them on the journey right uh, guide them uh, provide the right services the right talent and that essentially is leading to a very robust growth for the outsourcing ecosystem when we talk about digital products right so the numbers on the right of the slide right uh, nearly 25% growth in 2021 uh, to reach a 15 billion dollars uh, cumulative market size for outsourcing and we expect it to continue with this growth uh, trajectory right over the next 3 to 4 years as well right now uh, let's also very quickly discuss uh, what are the different kinds of roles that service providers are playing for enterprises right uh, i think four key pillars uh, and the middle pillars i think for the traditional pieces as well these these have been the heavy pieces where service providers have been called in to augment right to do projects etc right but interesting are the pillars on the both extremes uh, more interesting is the pillar on the left extreme right a uh, significant share in ideation and design and i think stemming from the fact that i touched upon earlier enterprises really need a partner who can help them figure out what to invest into where to invest into how much to invest into what to prioritize right what needs to be the road map etc 
that's where you know a lot of service providers they are building in consulting capabilities now helping them uh, to partner with their clients early on and then of course in the downstream activities as well so that's fairly interesting uh, next you know if i were to highlight uh, what are some of the factors that are driving uh, uh, enterprises to engage with uh, service providers or you know some value levers that the enterprises expect service providers to deliver so i think talent takes the top place right the scale the right competencies time to market is also a close second here so accelerating time to market for the products right cost savings not a top priority but still features out there so while doing all of that right can you help save costs as well right and then you know the unique ones that we see uh, for digital product engineering really picking up right uh, do you have the right ip do you have the right infrastructure that you've invested into right can you help us with uh, aspects around compliance security etc and as nishant already talked about right enterprises are even relying on service providers for ecosystem right can a service provider really orchestrate the ecosystem and i must say you know a lot of service providers that we've talked to right that we've assessed in the past they are doing fairly well around a variety of these aspects right to great degrees right so uh, you know uh, that makes us believe that service providers are going to be uh, partners for enterprises over the long haul right but let's also look at the flip side to it right what are some things that service providers could be doing better and let me invite akshat to take that forward please Sure. Thanks, Mayank. So, look, Mayank spoke about the drivers, and they are they are all fairly real, right? But there are also many considerations why uh, using a service provider uh, from the ecosystem it has not been as simple as just turning a switch on, right? So, what you see on the screen here um, is you know the last poll for the day. It's a again a very simple question: What key shortcomings um, are you facing in outsourcing digital product engineering services to service providers? Right. It's a multiple choice one, so feel free to select you know many. Um, there are aspects around their cost, um, their ability to help with innovation, their competence on next gen tech, uh, the fact that you know you require a certain degree of depth. There are also points around they they being slow in terms of uh, actually leading to results and a lot of other aspects around outcomes and attrition and so on. Let's give it another maybe ten seconds before we you know uh, bring this to a halt. Uh, but it's it's a it's a very interesting um, you know result that I see on the screen currently. Frankly, uh, much in contrast to the couple of polls we did earlier, where there was a concentration of results on a couple of options. Here, um, I think uh, you know this is a very very you know healthy spread. Uh, to be honest, again, you know this is not uh, at all um, you know in in contrast to what we. Anticipated. In fact, it's in resonance with what we've been hearing from the enterprises. Um, in fact, recently, like I had mentioned much earlier, uh, we did an assessment of the vendor landscape in the digital product engineering space um, through our proprietary peak matrix methodology. And you know, a lot of what you see on the screen um, and the options that people are selecting and expressing that that's the nature of their uh, you know issues and problems with working with service providers. We've, we've, you know, we've heard a lot of those. So aspects around the fact that, look, you know, they may have people, but do they really have the technology know-how? Uh, and even if they do, um, are those people deployable? Do they even have the, you know, required degree of domain depth and product understanding to start showing results? I mean, is that possible? Um, another very important aspect that we see in the results is, again, very much in sync with what we've been hearing from enterprises directly as well, is that, uh, over the last year, year and a half, the rampant attrition on the service provider side that has really limited their ability to add value, uh, and it had become an ongoing concern for many enterprises. Right? So, yeah, I mean, these are these are some of the very real challenges. If we if we go on to the next page now, you know, you will see that uh, the the digital product engineering peak matrix assessment that I was talking about for your reference. Uh, this is what the view of that looked like. We assessed multiple important companies in the ecosystem which are offering their services in the space. Uh, so this was the first time we did this assessment. Given the nascency of the market, we anticipate significant shifts uh, you know, during the next refreshes. But uh, there were some learnings for sure. I think the first one is that it's a very crowded market. There are lots of providers. 
uh, everybody based on their you know play in the ecosystem whether it's from the hardware side or from the software side they're all converging and becoming more of a chip to kind uh, chip to cloud kind of a you know player uh, the other thing that we observed is that this is also a level playing field by the way while of course the larger companies have a larger you know play there are a lot of smaller companies as well we've been able, which have been able to make a good mark especially uh, excuse me on the software side anyways you know this was one of our most anticipated assessments in the space and a lot of our research consumers found this research to be quite useful in the spirit of making it informed decisions and investments uh, so as a token of thanks, you know, if you, if you could turn to the next page as a token of thanks to the you know, audience for joining us today, as we come to the end of this session, we would like to offer an opportunity for all of you to uh, get a slice of these insights that were created in this report. So essentially, you can choose from uh, the list of vendors that have been provided here. We would be happy to provide you a complimentary uh, assessment, uh, sort of a comparison between the vendors that you choose. You can choose up to do that. I think the link will also be available uh, in the, the post webinar survey that we could roll out. So um, this uh, brings us to the end of the content that we had packaged for today, um, you know, and it is time that we open up for some questions. But just before we do that, let me take quick 30 seconds to make a small pitch um, and express the you know nature of our play in the ecosystem as well as how we engage. So essentially, look, you know, we're all at Everest Group, we are analysts and through our research and coverage and insights, we try and deliver value to uh, multiple ecosystem entities, but primarily two key segments. We have enterprises who are looking to spend and consume services uh, in the engineering services space as well as another, but I'm talking right now more in context of engineering. And on the other side, there are providers who are looking to offer those capabilities and services to the enterprises. So we, uh, you know, across these entities uh, and segments, we operate in two key ways. One, of course, you know, through our memberships, we bring the best of our knowledge to you. Uh, what we like to believe is that we bring the best of insights um, uh, in the moments that matter to you, uh, right? And through our membership, we are able to offer you all of our published research, uh, as well as we offer you an on-demand access to all of the data and the research that we have in the system, as well as analysts like ourselves to answer any questions that you might have and help you in decision making. On the other side, we also work on custom projects. So whether it is enterprises who are looking to make informed decisions uh, around locations, around talent, around sourcing strategy, or it is service providers who are trying to uh, you know, create better decisions on strategy or differentiation or growth in the engineering ecosystem, we're here to help. So reach out in case you have any such need, we'll be very happy to engage further. So um, that, like I said, that brings us to the end. And I think we have just one more minute left. Let me quickly see if we have, uh, you know, open questions. We tried to answer some on the way, uh, but let me take a couple of them, right? Uh, the first one that I see is, um, uh, it, it's around the deals. Are there any large deal archetypes in the digital product engineering services space? Mayank, would you like to take this one? I think, you know, uh, enterprises do like to start small, right? Uh, explore what digital product engineering would bring to them. But eventually, as they scale up, I think that's, you know, that makes for larger initiatives, large global initiatives even, right? Uh, I think the other aspect uh, that I would want to highlight is, uh, you know, whole the whole consulting-led approach here, right? Even when enterprises are starting small. So, you know, if you are partnering with them from the start, uh, you know, the service providers would make for a play in the downstream activities. And uh, talking about the downstream activities itself, I think uh, the large the last pillar, I think we touched upon it uh, sometime in our presentation even, right? Product sustenance or support. So downstream opportunities around data, especially, right? Monetizing data, building services around data. That's one area where, you know, I believe uh, a lot of large deals can be crafted. Thanks, Mike. And uh, let's, let's just take one more. And Nishant, I'm going to turn this one to you. Um, how do you look at life sciences um, as an industry, as far as the maturity of adopting uh, digital product engineering is concerned? 
uh, I think life sciences is a fairly vast term. Uh, we, of course, have both the medical devices space as well as the pharma industry, which, you know, cover, uh, which come under the life sciences world. Uh, talking about medical devices, and I think, uh, you know, we covered this in one of the earlier slides. I think uh, industries like automotive, consumer electronics are, I would say, slightly ahead of, you know, medical devices when it comes to adoption of digital products. But having said that, of course, medical devices is among the top, let's say, three or four industries uh, when it comes to adopting smart and connected products. So we've all seen plenty of examples around connected wearables, uh, essentially, uh, you know, biosensors, medical implants, uh, a whole host of devices which came up during the pandemic, right, as a result of all the use cases around remote patient monitoring and telehealth. So I think a lot of activity happening in the medical devices space, but it's not the front runner when it comes to industries. Got it. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Vishal. Thanks, Mayan, for, for those answers. Um, I, I realize we are already two minutes, um, you know, overboard on the slot, slotted time, so we wouldn't extend further. There are many more questions. Uh, we would like to take most of them offline, uh, and we will reach out with those. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, once again, for making the time. It was lovely discussing um, this theme with all of you. Uh, thanks. And, you know, with that, we come to the end of the session today.